just for context, so the, there's three presentations that, uh, that we're presenting during this meeting, two today and one tomorrow. And all three of these are designed to sort of work together to try to lay a common, more of a common um, kind of groundwork for future conversations because this ungulate topic and, and the, particularly how wolves and ungulates interact, that's, um, that's a pretty meaty topic um, that will probably involve uh, WAG and the agency talking about published research at some point. Uh, there may be some guest speakers. Uh, but probably it'd be productive if we can kind of get some uh, common understanding of some basic uh, principles. And so that's kind of where I'm starting with is, is really these foundational elements of ungulate population dynamics. Um, so this is a model called the logistic model. Not all populations of animals fit this model very well. For example, small mammals generally don't. Other animals that are strongly cyclic like snowshoe hares don't. But for ungulates, this is a pretty useful model for describing the way their populations tend to uh, perform. And so it's this first part of the curve uh, where it starts low and then kind of rapidly increases, um, that's exponential growth. And that's really not any different than what your bank account does if you have compounded interest. Um, it, it grows in the same way. But the interesting thing about ungulate populations in this, this model in particular is that that doesn't continue on forever. Um, there is this other piece that's captured in this yellow box where uh, things start to level off. The, the increase in the population tends to start to uh, slowing and eventually reaches this asymptote where it ends in this letter K, which we'll talk about uh, a bit more uh, in, a, in a moment. So this is a phenomenon occurring in this yellow box that we call density dependence. Um, so there are things that are happening in the environment and with the animals that changes the way the population is trending through time. So just because this has says math on it, this is really pretty straightforward stuff. So the basic math for this is that the number of animals at any future time step is equal to the number of animals at the previous time step, plus the births, minus the deaths, plus the immigrants, animals that walked in, minus the immigrants, animals that walked out. The number of animals that are added each time step uh, this increase is captured by uh, the second uh, pretty simple equation on the bottom, where it's the rate times the number of animals at time t is the increase that will occur over the next time step. But, so that's the growth period, but there's this density dependence penalty that sort of makes it fit this model. And so what the density dependence penalty is here, as you can see, is, is if the number of animals on the landscape is really a lot smaller than the carrying capacity, which is K, then this number is going to be really close to one. And so it's really going to be the growth is just going to be this R times NT. But if the, if the population is N is really large relative to K or even more than K, that number is going to turn into a number that's very close or is zero. And so then that basically wipes out the increase completely because R times NT times zero is zero. So we might describe phases that are associated with this uh, logistic model. So this early phase where there are a small number of animals, they're growing, but they're not growing super fast, we would call a colonization phase. Then there's this eruption phase where the sort of this exponential function starts to really kick in and you get this really rapid increase um, in animals or if it was your bank account in money. And then eventually we reach this uh, asymptote, which is, uh, we could define that as a resource limited equilibrium. And we'll, we're gonna sort of flesh all that out in more detail here in a minute. Just for, for uh, just because it's maybe interesting to people, so you've probably heard the term maximum sustained yield. So maximum sustained yield uh, 
uh, has really been traditionally estimated to be about half of, of the carrying capacity. So be right about there on that curve. So we can kind of think about what is happening with uh, the population <clears throat> as it moves along this curve by pondering what we would expect to see in a, in a variety of uh, sort of parameters. So one would be per capita forage nutrients and energy. So in the colonization phase, that is very, very high. There's almost no nutritional limitation. Animals are getting optimal seasonal intake or very close to it. And the specific, the, the competition between the same species, so animals within this population of ungulates is pretty minimal. As we move up the curve, still very high to high. The nutritional limitation is still pretty low. It's not absent perhaps. Um, we're still getting pretty good seasonal intake of nutrients and energy. And interspecific competition may be occurring, but it has pretty low consequence. When you get up to here, things are, have changed a lot. Um, the per capita forage nutrients and energy is, is low. Uh, there's a, a strong nutritional limit, limitation occurring. Seasonal intake uh, can be dramatically constrained. And this individual to individual competition within the population can be really high and is of consequence. So there are distinct winners and losers in this game. Individual nutritional condition, animals during colonization, um, they're in excellent shape. There's low variability, everybody's doing well. Uh, animals typically grow very fast and they reach pretty large adult mass for that particular species. In this part of the curve, it's still excellent to very good. It might be a little bit lower for animals that are lactating during the current year, but they're still doing pretty good. And of course, by the time you get up here, when you start incurring density dependence, that becomes modest. It becomes pretty low for lactators because of the energy demands of lactation. There can be high variation uh, among individuals. Animals typically grow slower and a lot of times they won't be um, sort of on the high end of mass for that particular species. If you, as you're going up uh, this population size with the curve, you're basically transitioning from really high vigor animals at the low end to pretty low vigor animals at the, at the high end or at the high density. Similarly, well, it's, it's pretty common to see reduced antler and horn growth as we move up there. Antlers and horns are secondary sex characteristics, so they're not critical for survival, but they are critical for um, sort of competition in the, in the breeding competition. But when animals are sort of faced with this trade-off, <clears throat> they'll start investing less in antler and horn growth. And of course, the fat stores that the animals are accumulating during the good part of the year, they're going to start declining um, from low density population to high density population. Survival, individual animal survival. Uh, colonization, it's excellent for adults. It can be really still pretty good for neonates and juveniles. As the density increases um, for a time, it'll still be very high for adults. It may still start to decline in neonates and juveniles, but really not until you start getting into that inflection point. And then up here, um, survival is, can be still high, but it may also be modest for adults, depending on how strong the density dependence is, but it may be poor in severe winters and for the older animals, uh, because they tend to be in a little poorer shape. Uh, it's typically modest in neonates and pretty low in juveniles during severe winters. Productivity, exceptional during colonization, high for first time breeders. So for example, in elk, the first time breeder is typically a yearling in, in colonization phase, yearling pregnancy rates can be really quite high. Pauses are rare. So when I say pause, and I'll use that term several times. So pauses are a phenomenon. So, these, 
most ungulates in North America, if they're on a relatively high nutritional plane, they can pull off reproduction every year, even if they raise their young uh, throughout the whole season, all the way to weaning. Um, it's still they're they're can they are able to recover condition during the rest of the summer and the early fall, and they're able to breed again. Um, and so in this phase, they they incur those costs pretty easily and recover pretty well. And so pauses, meaning skipping a year of reproduction, is rare. Productivity is still high during the sort of eruption phase. Uh, it can be still pretty good for first-time breeders and pauses are still gonna be relatively uncommon. But when you get up here, uh, where density dependence is sort of exerting a strong influence, pregnancy overall can be reduced uh, and reducing recruitment. Uh, here's where you start to see animals that are typically a little less productive, like yearlings again, uh, or really old animals for, it can be, it's gonna be lower. So yearling elk in a population that's operating in a strong density dependence, it's not gonna be nearly as high as it was uh, you know, at a lower density. And up here, pauses can be common. So animals that successfully raise a young uh, animal through the whole season and wean it, um, they're just unable to recover the full condition that they need to be able to be uh, productive again on the next cycle. And so a lot of times they'll end up into, you know, skipping a breeding season and they'll have sort of alternate year reproduction. So that K that was on that curve um, is typically it's been defined as the ecological carrying capacities is another way of thinking of it, ECC. And it's, it's this sort of limit of imposed by resource availability. As a definition, it's the theoretical maximum number of animals that can be supported in a specific environment in a state of quasi-equilibrium. And when you're at an ECC, births by definition equal deaths and the net growth rate is zero. That's that flat part of the curve. Ecological carrying capacity does not prevent strong herbivory impacts to vegetation. So at high density, the animals can actually degrade the habitat. Uh, they can impact the vegetative growth patterns of, of the forage plants um, and you, you can actually have essentially damage to the uh, sort of forage environment. It's not a fixed state. Uh, it varies seasonally almost always and it can vary through time based on weather and sort of climatic effects. There's this interesting relationship between the animals and ECC, e ECC shapes the animals and the animals shape the ECC via feedbacks. And that adds to the dynamic nature of the equilibrium. In range management, there's a sort of a different concept and carrying capacity is generally defined as the number of animals or use that can be supported without degrading the plant community or not exceeding a specific level of utilization. So in, if, it, if you're a range manager, um, you're really trying to sort of make sure that the number of animals that are on the landscape are not more than the habitat can support without uh, loss of condition of the plant community. So that's a simple model. The way it sort of may play out in the real world is, is a little bit different. So um, instead of it being this nice, smooth, exponential growth, got this sort of inflection point, and then you get this nice flat, straight um, sort of equilibrium at carrying capacity, it often looks more like this. Um, so the animals may overshoot carrying capacity. That will have an impact. The animals will die off typically in winter. Um, there may be degradation of the plant community. So you can see that carrying capacity dotted red line sort of changes, it goes down with time. Um, and so you kind of get more of this, you know, with the, sort of the classical oscillation um, where the animals sort of overshoot and then they, their density is reduced. And so then the plant community re responds, the per capita energy and nutrient intake increases again, the animals grow, and then they just kind of do this over and over again. Um, so this whole subject matter about 
population regulation and plant community effects uh, from grazing uh, guilds. It's, it's a really extensive and very interesting body of literature. And there's some really, really good papers written by some really, really smart people that explore these topics uh, in detail. And I've just put on here just a sort of a smattering of, of some of the things that are out there. And we can certainly, anybody that's interested in this sort of this kind of stuff, we can help guide you maybe to some, some pretty informative pieces. So a little bit more on carrying capacity. Um, as you can see from the sort of the abstracts of these two papers I posted to the right, um, it's, it's got kind of a mixed review in the literature. It's a, I, I kind of think of it as it, carrying capacity is a little bit like a black hole. Both exist by theory, both are difficult to observe directly, and both are detected mostly by their effects on other things. And by black hole, I mean this sort of, you know, astrophysics thing where um, a star collapses on itself and eventually creates this sort of vacuum that sucks anything in its vicinity. You can't see it with a telescope, but there are other ways that astronomers detect them. It's really difficult to estimate ecological carrying capacity finitely. Um, you know, early attempts were just like, if you know how much biomass is produced uh, in a landscape, you can, you know, sort of how many, how much each animal would need. You can kind of do some math. That ought to work out, right? But it doesn't work out very well because there's, it's, it's more complicated than that. More complex approaches have certainly been developed and there's a lot of published papers uh, documenting those attempts. Those have fared better, but it's still a really difficult thing to uh, finitely estimate. Because of that, we generally don't know where ECC is until we get there and start to see these sort of strong um, effects that are observable. Again, it's dynamic, it varies seasonally and across years. And this is an important point. It, managers are almost never trying to manage ungated populations at or near, near ECC. Those would be large populations of low vigor animals in degraded habitat. And so that's, that's really almost never the goal. I mean, I guess you could argue that sort of the park services natural regulation paradigm is kind of that, but, um, you know, most agencies that are managing, for example, for uh, hunting, um, they're not going to be uh, at all trying to manage uh, populations to this point where they're really under strong density dependent effects. So there has been work done towards developing something that would be potentially more useful as a concept of carrying capacity than sort of the st straight up K or ECC. So ecologists and resource managers have promoted a, kind of a redefined concept of nutritional carrying capacity. This concept focuses on the number of animals a landscape can sustain in a desired nutritional state. And that's gonna be something less than ECC. Nutritional carrying capacity would reflect the management goal of high vigor animals, resilient to many limiting factors and yielding non-degraded plant communities. It encourages not just forage biomass, but also animal foraging behavior and nutrition energetics. Animals will not eat a diet of only one kind of forage. Um, wild, wild ungulates just will not do that. Um, and they will also be reluctant to forage in certain biomass settings, even though there's the right species there. It's just inefficient. And so they, they're pretty reluctant to do that. So it, you have to sort of incorporate this behavioral aspect uh, about animal, how animals select forage and use forage um, to, to better kind of approach the nutritional carrying capacity problem. It's difficult to estimate and approaches that have been used and promoted are pretty data hungry. So let's shift gears a little bit. So let's talk about what happens uh, with demographic um, parameters as density approaches ECC. And, and what's going to be on the rest of the slide are, uh, is an idea that was originally proposed by uh, the late Lee Eberhardt, who was a really um, 
kind of world-class ecologists. Um, and so the first thing you'd expect to see as you get stronger and stronger density dependence effects is that juvenile survival is going to decline. Usually that happens during the winter. You're going to see increased age of first reproduction. So again, as an example, using yearling elk as first time breeders, um, the pregnancy rate for yearlings are, is going to decline as density dependence starts to operate uh, more prominently. Eventually you get uh, decreased age-specific fecundity, and fecundity is a word that's on that glossary, um, but it's essentially, it, it ref it's a term that reflects the productivity uh, of, the, of the individuals in the population. <clears throat> and then lastly, the last thing you'll see is decreased adult survival. If you remember from that survival slide, we said that uh, survival in adults continues to be pretty high through the whole cycle uh, of that logistic model. This is, a, this is a really informative graph. I mean, it looks maybe intimidating a little bit at first, but there's a, there's a lot, all these pieces of the story are on this one graph. So the, the thing that kind of looks like a, a side view of a mountain with the little triangles. So that's the, this is a population of bighorn sheep in a place called Ram Mountain, which is in Alberta. And so that's what the population was doing. It was, it's, it was increasing. And then as you move to the right, it got to a point where it, um, started to decline. The, the little open squares at the top that you see going along there, that's adult survival. And as you can see, adult survival stayed pretty constant through this whole cycle. And what that, that graph of what the population did sort of suggests that they did sort of surpass carrying capacity at about 92. Um, but even though they did do that, the adult survival remained high. The, the little black dots, that's what happened with juvenile survival. And you can see that that stayed relatively high uh, up as the population increased. But when it got to a pretty high density, and as particularly as it moved over the top of what was presumably carrying capacity, that began to decline. And it's, and it's really apparent in that, in that figure. So you can see this figure with what the population did, how adult survival stayed relatively constant, and, but juvenile survival did not. Juvenile survival started to decline uh, pretty substantially. So most of the time with most populations, we don't really know where we're at on this curve. Like, I mean, we, we didn't see them start. Um, they, we are at some place on that curve. Uh, we might know if we're kind of up there where carrying capacity and strong dairy density dependence is operating. Um, but we, we really don't usually see populations from their origin. But well, there's a couple of good examples in Washington where we have. And one of them is uh, elk occupying the Hanford uh, nuclear facility near Tri-Cities, uh, also known as the Rattlesnake Hills elk population. And this population was created by about five individuals, we think, that walked into the site in about 1972 during the winter. Uh, everybody expected them to go home uh, after the winter ended, but they didn't. They stayed and started to grow slowly and essentially established a resident herd on Hanford, uh, mostly on the arid lands ecology reserve part of Hanford. So this little yellow arrow is me starting my master's thesis work. So I came to Washington originally uh, as a graduate student to do research on this Hanford elk population. And when I started in 1982, there were 27 elk in that population. Um, there had been no studies previous to that. So we were kind of looking at this thing at the beginning uh, and also you know, what made the project sort of happen was that these elk were kind of living in a place that the current thinking about elk said should be pretty hard for them to do. Uh, but as you can see through this uh, time cycle up through last year on this graph, this population kind of did what we saw in, uh, from the logistic curve. It, it grew slowly and then it reached this inflection point where you had enough animals that the, the exponential effects started to be pretty dramatic. They grew rapidly. Um, 
you know, a lot's happened. So there's some missing data there. There have been surveys uh, every year after about 2000. Uh, there, for a while, there weren't surveys. Um, animals have been removed uh, various ways from this population. So it doesn't, doesn't look exactly like the logistic curve, but you can see that that beginning part really follows that pattern pretty well. The other really good example happened at Mount St. Helens. So uh, in 1980, the mountain blew in May, um, and in a certain part of that landscape, every elk that was standing there died. Um, and was wiped away. Um, many of them almost vaporized. And so this area became, part of it became devoid of elk, but pl plant community succession occurred fairly rapidly in parts. And pretty soon, um, not very long after that, um, the environment started to be suitable again by elk and elk started colonizing it by walking in from areas outside of the blast zone. Um, a graduate student named Evelyn Merrill uh, studied elk during this time. I actually helped Evie in the field when I first got to Washington. And so I was sort of out there again at this early stage. Um, and then what happened at St. Helens is the elk population continued to grow pretty rapidly because much of the landscape had been commercial forest. Um, the owners wanted to get back into production. And so there was a lot of effort put into reforestation. And so, um, and so there was a lot of change in the plant community early on before you know, sort of trees started to close in again. Um, this was a really great place for elk to live. When I was out there with Evie, um, there were fireweed plants that were eight or nine feet tall. Um, all those nutrients that had been in the forest and all the critters in the forest uh, went into the, into the ground as and sort of served as fertilizer and it was a really productive fast recovering environment and for a while it was like about as good of elk habitat as you could think of but as the elk population grew and then the landscape started changing because the forest started closing in again carrying capacity undoubtedly started going downward while the elk population was going upward and um, by about the late uh, mid to late 90s, um, there were there were pretty becoming pretty obvious evidence that this population had uh, had probably overshot carrying capacity. Uh, there was a lot of sort of winter mortality happening, and and so we we saw this phenomenon with this Mount St. Helens recolonization event that really looks very much like the logistic model. Okay, so again, when we start reading literature and um, papers about what populations of ungulates are doing, we're often interested in sort of what is the trend in the population? How are the numbers changing in time? And the way we do that is a couple of different metrics. One is known as the finite rate of increase or what we call lambda. And that's a really simple metric. It's basically the number of animals at uh, time step t plus one divided by the number of animals that were there last time step. Uh, using lambda as an indicator of trend, uh, if the population is the same, if it's nt plus one is the same number of animals approximately as the animal, number of animals at time t, it's gonna be one, right? So that's lambda equal one is a population that is stable. Lambda over one is a population that's growing and lambda less than one is a population that's declining. And you can derive from that another metric that's pretty useful, which is called the exponential rate of increase, which is simply the natural log of whatever that lambda value is. And this, this sort of recenters um, the metric on zero. So a population with an R of zero is stable, not changing. Uh, if R is more than zero, the population is growing, and if it's less than zero, the population is declining. And so just to show you an example, so if we had a population that doubled from over a time step, the lambda for that would be two, right? So it's twice as many animals at T plus one as that we had at T. If it halved, it would be 0.5, right? So essentially the, you know, the magnitude of this is like two or the inverse of two. Interestingly, using R as the metric, if the population doubles, it's 0.7. If it halves, it's minus 
And so for that reason, a lot of times uh, we, uh, population ecologists find R to be a more useful and more easily interpretable metric for trend. Uh, because if, if you have sort of similar magnitudes of change, they're going to be the same, just differing by sign. Whereas the, the lambda, you kind of have to think about it a bit more because it's not, it's not quite as intuitive um, by just looking at the lambda value. So, um, so just a few more important terms. These are on the glossary. Uh, I'm not going to hit very many of the terms that are on the glossary. We'd certainly be happy to answer anybody's questions at any point in time about anything that's on that glossary that we don't talk about today. We won't, we won't get to a lot of those terms today. But here's a few that I think are pretty important. And you will absolutely see these if you start reading the literature about uh, ungulates and predation effects. Limiting factor. A limiting factor is any factor that limits population growth. And its common use is a factor that causes non-trivial mortality or in some way systematically reduces productivity. It does not require density dependence and it may or may not promote an equilibrium density. Regulating factor is a limiting factor that affects population growth and has an effect that varies with density. A regulating factor typically facilitates population increases at low densities and declines at high densities. Because of that, a regulating factor per can promote a quasi-stable equilibrium density that might be less than the ecological carrying capacity. So, important point, some limiting factors may also be regulating factors, but not all of them. Another really important term that you will run into all the time in this body of literature is compensatory mortality. Compensatory mortality is a cause of mortality that when changed in magnitude is associated with a relatively equivalent and opposite change in another cause of mortality, such that the overall all annual survival will remain unchanged. And that contrasts what, what we call additive mortality, which is a cause of mortality that when changed in magnitude results in a relatively equivalent and opposite change in the overall survival of animals in the population. And there's, again, there's, there's lots of really good literature that has explored um, these issues of compensatory and additive mortality. And I'm sure uh, members of WAG will, will at some point be reading some of those and talking with uh, agency staff and some other scientists about that. And that's really all I have for sort of this elementary fundamental piece.